Hey folks, welcome to another Triple T Thursday. For those of you just joining us, that's Tools, Tips, and Talk, where I talk about some stuff that interests me and hopefully it interests you. So first off in today's episode, I want to just say a big thank you uh, to, to all of you, the uh, viewers. Without you, I wouldn't have a channel. Um, there's a, a really big milestone coming up probably in the next week or so. Uh, where we reach a thousand subscribers. So that's pretty cool. Uh, I can't believe it's come. My goal was uh, to do this in within a year and I started the channel about 10 months ago. So we're a little ahead of schedule. So that's great. And I'm really happy about that. Also wanted to say <clears throat> a thank you to all of the cool people that I've met um, in this adventure. And I mean, mostly like YouTube, other YouTubers, um, people I've met on Facebook. Um, so thank you to all. This is such a great community. Uh, and once you get into the bladesmithing community, uh, folks just help each other out and encourage each other. And I think it's one of the best communities out there. A uh, couple special shout outs. Um, Aaron at Ailey Knives. Uh, you've helped me a lot. So thank you very much. Everyone go check out Aaron's channel. Uh, Eric Rivers, fantastic channel. Um, watch his all the time. You definitely want to go check his out as well. Uh, Bill over at WJ Blades. He and I have talked on the phone so many times, throwing ideas back and forth. Um, also Spencer at um, Heavy Forge. If you haven't checked out his channel, you really need to because um, he's just kind of starting it. He's got a couple hundred subscribers, but is doing some great things. Uh, is making really cool hammers. Spencer, I want one. Um, and we've been bouncing ideas off each other for, uh, for the past little while on, on a, a, another project you're going to see soon. So go check out his channel. So big thank you to all the people that I've met. If I didn't mention you, sorry, but, um, oh, Laz Harup, another one. Uh, he's helped me quite a bit over the, over the time here. So big thank you to him as well. So in, in addition to the thanks, the topic for today is Damascus, kind of a Damascus 101. I've had a couple of people ask me recently, hey, tell me about your Damascus process and what you do. Um, so I thought I would spend some time on that today. So let's move down to the table. There's a bunch of points I wanna go over and uh, we'll talk about all things Damascus. Okay, let's talk about Damascus. So first, what is it? When we refer to Damascus and what I'm gonna talk about Damascus is really what most people call, or some people call, pattern welded steel. Just not to get confused, I don't want to get into the whole Wootz debate, which is, oh, you know, Wootz is some special crucible steel, da 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 da, it doesn't exist anymore, that's fine. When, when we talk about Damascus, we're talking about layering steels that have different etching properties to get a pattern in the steel, hence pattern welded. So there's a good example of a Damascus blade. Okay, so now that we know what we're talking about, let's talk about steel selection. So you want steels that have um, one that etches dark and one that will etch at least one uh, that will etch uh, a lighter or silver. And the most typical ones that people use is 1080 or some 10, 10XX, meaning 1080, 1084, 1095, any of those. Um, you can also use 80 CRV too. Um, it etches very dark. Um, so those are good candidates. I would not use um, 52100. Uh, that does not etch very dark. 5160, although some people use it, it doesn't forge weld very well. Um, and it doesn't etch very dark. So I, I don't think that's a great candidate for Damascus. The most common... Um, steel for the the silver part is 15 and 20 and that's pretty much exclusively what people use there are some other alternates but that's a good selection um that's typically bandsaw um, blade steel typically um so let's talk about thickness thickness kind of goes with this guy layers how many layers do you want well the more layers the better you would think um, that's not always true. There's kind of a, you know, I like to go at least 150 layers, 100 layers. 
Um, it depends on the pattern because if you're doing a pattern that has a lot of depth to it, you're going to need more layers. And I'll talk about that later when we get into patterns. Um, but I typically like to go with the more layers you have in your initial billet, your initial stack, the more you're going to have later, which means go with thinner steel. So I like to use the thinnest steel I can find pretty much, which is eighth inch 1080. And I have this, um, I think it's 0.046. Uh, it's 3 sixty-fourths, um, 15 and 20. Uh, you don't need the same thickness of steels. Uh, I will use thinner. Um, if you use thinner 15 and 20, then you will get a darker blade overall because there'll be less nickel in it and you will still see the layers. And that's what this one is here. Um, so uh, that's generally a good, um, a good selection. And when I'm making Damascus, um, I typically will always use the same billet. I will use 16 layers of this 1080 and 15 layers of the uh, 15 and 20 for 31 layers. And I always keep the 1080, the thicker steel, on the outside of the billet. Uh, just to, because this is pretty thin, you don't really want this on the outside because it will bow and warp, so it's good to have it encased. So that's another good tip is have your your thicker steel, typically it's going to be your, your 10 series on the outside of your billet. So, um, more a little more about layers. When you get into a high layer count, um, the max I typically go is about 500 layers. There are some reasons to go higher. Uh, I once made a mistake in... You know the 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 steel the the blade I was going for the pattern I was going for didn't work out so we ended up um, with just a higher layer count just the way it worked out and it was about 750 layers. Once you get up above 500, sometimes lower, but mostly when you get up to 500 layers, you'll start to get what's called chatoyance, which means when you look at the blade, it will actually look like it's almost three dimensional, even though you run your finger across the blade and you know it's flat you'll get kind of a 3D effect in the layers. And that's really cool. Um, and especially with um, kind of things with like wave patterns or like randomness even, uh, it can look really, really cool. So um, definitely try a higher layer count to get that chatoyance. Um, it's a pretty cool effect. So let's talk about prep. So step three, prep your steel. Cleaning, that means um, both grinding the mill scale off. So this is mill scale. You can see it's got that grayish thing. That's all got to come off. This has to be shiny steel. I will take this usually, um, I'll use a surface grinder, but you can just take it to your platen or whatever grinder you have and get it nice and smooth. Like I usually at least use about a 120 to get it very smooth and very flat. This is probably the most important step here is the prep. So get that nice and flat uh, and clean. Uh, this 15 and 20 you see is really shiny when I get it. So I typically just um, make sure that there's no raised edges, especially when you're uh, cutting it with a chop saw because uh, you don't want your layers to sit proud because you have an edge here. So I will cut these um, in, I always do my billets in four inch sizes just because these usually come in 12 inches and I get three so it just works out that way um, so I will cu I'll cut all these first to length and then I'll clean them all and then I will weld and since th that's another reason why I do four inch billets because then I only need a, a bead of weld on every one of the corners okay so if that's my I'll run a bead of weld down the stack on the four corners because then I know it's not going to any way get incorporated into the billet. And you may have seen me in a couple videos, even when I'm, you know, I'm forging and I forged it down. If I'm at a point where I know the forge weld is, is stuck, I'll actually take it to the grinder while it's hot and I'll just kind of grind those corners just to make sure I have no weld in my, um, in my billet. And I don't like to put weld on the sides for that reason. So I use a MIG now, now that I have a MIG welder, uh, I MIG weld the sides, uh, the corners. Um, I use for years, I've, I used a stick welder. That's easy too, but you need to, to weld these up. 
And then I like to weld, um, some people like the big long stick to stick it in the forge. I do not. I like a little short one and I like to use tongs to um, bring it in and out of the forge. So you'll see that I put just a little piece of rebar uh, on the end of the billet. Just personal preference. And the reason I like to do this because I like to close up my forge completely and I can't do that if there's a big handle sticking out. Soaking. So once I prepped the billet, welded the sides, it's all nice and clean, and I'll take a brush and I'll brush off all of the, um, the weld gunk uh, on the billet. Uh, I will drop it in, I have a paint can full of kerosene. I will drop it in that paint can. Sometimes overnight, I tack the, the top on it and, uh, and let it sit. And what that does is it, it lets all of that, that oil, fuel, whatever, seep, in, seep into the cracks and it's gonna burn off and burn out any oxygen when you put that in the forge because you do not want any oxygen between the layers. So really that's just making sure that that oxygen is burning off. So whether it's kerosene, I've seen some people use diesel fuel, whatever. I wouldn't say it's a necessary step, but to me, any kind of insurance is good. So forge welding. So first thing first, I will put this billet in the forge and I will get it up to a red temperature. And just so the steel is hot, it's not forge welding hot yet. I will put it in and I'll heat it up. If there's any kind of, kind of seams or maybe if there's a bow, um, I might give it a little tap and just kind of press it in the press just to make sure there's no gaps in the layers, especially if you're just using a, a round wheel. You know, sometimes you'll have like a high spot or whatever. If you just press those together, you're going to get, you're going to close up any air spaces and that's good. Um, you know, you do, you do want to be careful because you're bringing out of the forge, which means you could get some oxidation. The first thing I do is as soon as I bring it out of the forge, I use flux and I flux the edges, just the edges, not the flat part on the top, but just the edges. Now let's talk about flux. So flux for flux, I'm using borax. This is the mule team borax you get at, uh, at your supermarket. Um, that is going to melt. Okay. And, and it is going to form kind of a barrier so that oxygen is not getting between your layers. And it also, if you do have scale, it makes the scale come off much easier with a wire brush. So, you know, you don't need flux. I consider it kind of a, kind of a safety blanket um, and some insurance. And I only use it while I'm doing the forge weld. Okay, so I'll, when, it, when the billet is red, I'll flux it. Then I will press it, and I'm, I'm using a press, but if you're using a hammer and you're setting the weld, then I would put the flux on it every time right before it goes back in the forge. Scrape all of the uh, scale off of it, reflux it into the forge, and then you're bringing out, hammer it, and then repeat. If you're going to be hand hammering your Damascus, okay, you better plan for a lot of loss to scale, probably at least a third of the billet you're going to lose to scale. So do that math. If you're going to use a hammer, um, you need light presses when it's up to forge welding temp. And we'll talk about how to know that. But typically you want to go across your billet in a kind of geometric pattern. Um, don't just, um, you know, do the outsides like this because that'll kind of bow up your center. You do it in a, some people start at the center and go out. Um, just make sure you're very systematic. Don't do random taps on it. Uh, you want to, you know, do it systematically. If you use too hard of a, of a pressure, when you tap it here, it's going to pop this side up. So that's why you need light taps to set the weld and you're progressively going to get harder. If you're using a press like I do, I just slide this whole thing fits on my flat die. So I will put the whole thing in and I'll press it right down at once. Um, not with a ton of um, pressure, but enough that I'm setting the weld. And I will do that three times. So I'll just press it in, you know, clean it up, reflux it, 
back in the forge, bring it out, and I will repeat that three times when I'm setting the weld. Before I get aggressive, before I start doing any drawing, just to press it down and make sure that I get a good forge weld. So let's talk a bit about brushes. Uh, this is maybe a topic not a lot of people um, cover. Get one of these. This is going to be, um, you know, your, your typical blacksmith brush. You'll notice it's not the wire kind. It has these flat pieces. This is going to remove a lot of scale. These are great for a really tough scale, and you definitely want one of these. Okay, I'll use this to take the scale off. If I'm doing forge welding, after I do this, I will go and use one of these. These fine wires will get right between the cracks, and this will get all the scale out between those, those thin, not cracks, but the seams between your layers. And that will prevent you from getting inclusions and cold shuts and because you're going to remove the any kind of scale between the cracks. So I definitely recommend you do both. Do this one and then do the, the thin wire one. So let's talk about forge welding temperatures. And this is actually another reason I do like to use flux. Um, when I flux the billet and I put it in, it has a, a tendency when you pull it out, if it's at forge welding temperature, it will steam. I don't really know another term. You will see kind of a billowing, steamy-like smoke coming off of the billet. And that is how you know you're, you're kind of at forge welding temperature. And this can take, depending on your forge, can take a while. And what I usually like to say is put your billet in, get it up what you think is temperature, and leave it in for another 10 minutes. Okay, you're better off be it being too hot than too cold. If you see, if you watch Forge and Fire, number one issue people have when they're forge welding is they don't get it hot enough. It's not that they're building up scale, they're taking it out too soon and they're not letting it get up to temp. So it should be bright, bright yellow. Um, and it should, if you're using flux, it should have that steamy, smoldering, smoke, smoky effect coming off of it. And your flux will be bubbling inside of the forge. Okay, let's talk about restacking. Uh, I don't hot restack. Um, I will take the billet out and uh, I will cut it on a bandsaw. And I, I like to always cut the ends off. Like if this is your billet and let's see, the billet's here and you've got the handle here. Well, now it would be this long. Um, I will actually cut both ends off. Some people will cut these two sections, stack one on top, one under, and have the handle here. What I find is then when I start pressing, I start to get weird cold shots in the, from the middle piece to the next layer. So I don't like to do that. I like to have nice, even, clean stacks. Uh, so I'll cut both ends off, divide it up. That's where you want to use a tool like this. It's super handy for Damascus to um, cut this into equal pieces. So you can see how that works. And I don't have to do any measurement. I've already got, oh, you know, three equal places. And then I can just go to the bandsaw, set this on my uh, on my guide, and I don't even have to measure anything. Uh, for restacking, again, that'll tell you how many layers. I start at 31. I know if I do one restack of three, I'm at uh, 93 layers. If I do four, you know, I'm at more. Uh, calculate that before, have a plan before you go in to know how many layers you're gonna have. Okay, let's talk about patterns. Um, I've kind of split these into three, basic, intermediate, and advanced. Um, the basic pattern are ones where you've stacked up the layers and you're just going to do some minor manipulation, if at all, on that layered Damascus. Obviously, random just means, you know, you're going to stack these layers up and just the, the act of hammering or pressing is going to kind of change those layers slightly so that when you, you know, you put your bevels in, you're gonna see some wavy lines. That's what random Damascus, random Damascus can look great. Um, so don't discount random Damascus. Ladder pattern, okay, you've got your layers like this, uh, or if they're like this, you're gonna cut kind of grooves and uh, you're gonna get kind of these bars or bands in, uh, in the Damascus. I'm not gonna go over each one of these, but know that it's a pretty simple one. It's easy to do. Um, a lot of people do it. I've got videos on that. 
raindrop similar except you're going to use a drill press and you're just going to drill holes in it it's going to make little circles in your blade looks cool let's get into the more intermediate ones um i was actually debating should twist belong into basic or should twist belong in intermediate and i decided to put it in intermediate just because uh, a lot of people do have problems with twist that's you're going to take your your billet you're going to kind of round it out which a lot of people fail to do round it um, and then kind of square the corners and then twist it um, and then you're going to get a, a pattern and my advice for twist um, do two or three times more twists than you think you need um, you'll get a much better pattern the more twists you have cable uh, if you have a big piece of cable um, the trick here to cable is you really need to weld up the ends and then untwist it, let the air and everything get to the inside because really cable is all one steel. What you're doing is you're letting it, um, carburization get inside and that's what's going to give you the difference between, that's what's going to make you see the strands of cable and then you're going to twist it back together trying to get all of the, um, you know all of the scale out of it uh twist it back together and there's some great videos in fact um spencer at heavy forge has got a great video on uh, on cable damascus canister basically you're taking canister uh, a square tube and you're putting stuff in it um other other steels filling it with the powder and then crushing it my um advice on canister get yourself some stainless steel tube you will save yourself so much time um, you know, you could go the liquid paper route, which is terrible. Um, you'll have mixed results. I, tr I, I warn you on the liquid paper, what the liquid paper is supposed to do is keep the inner steel from sticking to the canister. Um, I give it 50, 50, uh, you're better off with a stainless steel canister, honestly. Um, cause it will not weld. Uh, if you watch some of my videos on canister, the inside just pops right out. I think I spent, I don't know, 30 bucks for a three foot piece of stainless steel tube. So it's definitely worth it. You can do all kinds of things with canister um, Damascus, just different patterns and how you put things in the billet. Now let's talk about more advanced ones, um, feather and mosaic. And uh, I put feather here because feather is kind of complicated. Um, I have a, a watch my feather Bowie uh, playlist uh, making that feather Bowie. Um, it's a, it's a tough pattern. Mosaic. So that's what I just want to spend a little time on. Um, let's get this out of the way. So mosaic Damascus really relies on kind of the, I'll call it the, the mother pattern, which is crushed W's. And, uh, I want to go over how to do crushed W's because that really is the basis, or I think is the basis for almost all mosaics unless you're doing canister, but just specific layered mosaics, you need to know how to do crush W's. So the way crush W's work, and well, what are crush W's? You're gonna start with just a normal layered stack. And then you're going to press either with squaring dies or hammer. It's much easier on a press with squaring dies. In fact, I would not recommend you attempt canister, uh, sorry, mosaic Damascus without some kind of press or power hammer. Uh, it is complicated, uh, you're gonna need it. So you're going to press in the corners and that's gonna give you a pattern kind of like this. You can see how it's kind of mushed in the corners. That's gonna let you rotate this. And one of the reasons you've pressed the corners in is so that when you press it this way or now this way, the layers are on top of each other and they're not just gonna shear apart. So that's one reason to do that. So you're gonna crush this down and now you have a billet that looks like this. And this is, it's actually gonna be much even more pronounced depending on you know, how tall your billet is. This is what we call the C's. You can see these are C's. When you restack this, now you have your W's. This here, and you can have a stack of four or more, the crushed W's is gonna be the basis because now that you have crushed W's, you can do lots of other things by taking this pattern this way 
making a billet so that there's crushed W's and then restacking that really high and slicing it down the center gives you a brilliant feather. So that's what really makes your feather. And that's actually the, what I miss doing when I did the feather on my feather bow is I just split this. I really should have gone to the crushed W's and that kind of gives you those nice rounded feathery edges. So my next feather will definitely be uh, crushed W's. From the crushed W's, you can now manipulate this even more. So if you start to compress the corners, this is where you'll get something like this. Not only am I compressing the corners, I'm re-squaring it. Okay, I'm, I'm basically crushing the corners to make a square. You know, I'm re-squaring it. That's going to give you these other patterns. And this may not be exactly what it looks like, but you'll get different patterns. And now... If you slice this and restack it and turn it, turn it four ways, that's how you get an explosion pattern or different types of patterns. If you take two of these, you can get like, it looks like little flames. There's the, the possibilities are endless um, with re-squaring and squishing and squishing this way. And now you, you know, if you crush it this way, you'll get all kinds of different patterns, but it all really starts from C's crush W's and then manipulating this in some way and then tiling them. So what is tiling? You're going to cut slices at an angle, usually about a 35 degree angle like this. Okay. You're going to cut slices like that. You're the bars here. You're cutting them like this so that now you can layer them like that. Okay, this is going to be your, then when you press them, you're not just, you know, you're pressing these two edges together when you're pressing this way. Okay, so that's going to fuse well, forge well, rather, these seams. And watch my explosion pattern Damascus video. I'll put a link up uh, in the corner here uh, on how to do this and how to get a mosaic. And this is really how you, once you tile it out, you're seeing the pattern on the end of the billet, and now that you've cut slices, you're seeing the, the pattern on the top. So folks, I know a ton of information, and I've talked a while on Damascus and how to do different patterns. You know, I, I'm not the expert. I'm giving you the basics. Um, I find this fascinating. This part is, is some of my, my favorite part of of bladesmithing and forging is making these kind of patterns and manipulating them. And I'm really just starting out. I've done an explosion pattern and I've done some others, but I'm definitely doing more and more on this side of the house with mosaics. So that should give you a primer on Damascus. If I've missed anything, um, definitely uh, put something in the comments. If there's other things you want to see, let me know. And, uh, you know, let's see what you guys do with Damascus. Thanks for watching. Remember to hit that like and subscribe, and we'll see you on the next one.